My name is Todd Reichert. Uh, Daniel Bigham is on Zoom right now, and he will be giving the presentation. Uh, this talk is going to be about our um, implementation of using Wolfram language to build our ERP system. Um, ERP data is basically business data. So um, I will go ahead and just turn it over to Daniel, and then hopefully he can finish on time, and then we can have a little Q&A. So Daniel, you want to take over? Sure. All right. Right. So um, like many organizations, uh, Wolfram Research has a, a, an ERP system for our business data. Uh, it is fairly old. I think it was started about 20 years ago. <clears throat> and so uh, a curiosity arose some time ago, what it would look like if we were to kind of rebuild that system uh, in the Wolfram language and what would the benefits of that be? So there are some good reasons to be curious about that because uh, the design tenants of the Wolfram language have been very successful about using things like intelligent defaults, uh, automating as much as possible, and things like natural language. And those are things that uh, we figure would be quite useful in a, in a business system as well. So the way that we represent data uh, in the kernel is simply as associations or rather nested associations. So here's an example of a person entity with various properties. Uh, and then notice that the cats here are actually uh, associations as well, and they're nested within the person. So that's very powerful because you can have a list of those to, to get a data set. You can, there are lots of uh, operations from, I can. So yeah, there's lots of good uh, data operations in the Wolfram language uh, for slicing and dicing lists of associations. Um, but where it really begins is defining our entity types uh, symbolically. Uh, so here we have a person and a cat and their properties and the types of those properties. And once you do that, there's actually a, a, a lot of stuff that you can automate. Before I get into uh, those things, let's just look at the core uh, operations that we support for working with data. So these are things uh, relating to storing and, retri and retrieving data. So here I have a person entity, and I'm going to call entity create to store that in the database. And what comes back is the same thing, but notice that there have been ID properties annotated on each of the, uh, the entities. And that tells us that this is now something that actually corresponds to something in a database. So then we'll call entity get to retrieve those from the database, and I can give a single condition or I can give a composite condition. Um, and then of course there are operations for modifying and deleting. The modify operation is kind of interesting because you can give it uh, all the properties or however many you want of your entity and it will return back to you an indication of what it was that actually changed. Okay, so I was saying that there is a lot that you can infer if you have a good symbolic representation of your entity types. Uh, we can create database tables and link them together with appropriate foreign keys, but perhaps more interestingly, it also gives us the opportunity to evolve that database schema automatically for you over time. So imagine you've got a person.wl file that defines this person entity type and you want to add a new property called last name, rather than interacting with a, a database or issuing commands to do this, you can just edit your file and run a smart reload function. And that will uh, intelligently figure out what files have been modified. And not only that, what it was that you changed about your entity type. So to demonstrate that in this case, I have the old expression and the new expression, and this is just showing um, how we're able to, to figure out what has changed and then produce the change for the database schema. And then perhaps best of all, the ability to run a, a single deployment function uh, to target uh, an enterprise private cloud and to push those schema changes when you're ready uh, so that your EPC is up to date. So let's just go through a lot of the things that can be automated or streamlined with a good representation of your entity types. Um, as mundane as it is, it's useful to not have to write your own validation code. In this case, uh, the property last name has been misspelled and we get an indication of that. It's also an interesting example of where the Wolfram language's symbolic nature is quite handy in an ERP system because it allows us to generate code or to write code that writes code. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the person entity type and I'm asking for a pattern that can be used to validate that. And so here's a pattern involving alternatives and repeated null and so on. And once we have that, we can just call match Q and uh, it can do the, the, the quick initial validation for us. And it does it very fast, between 20 and 70 times faster than if you were to loop over the properties and do it manually. <clears throat> 
Uh, we can also produce uh, entity types. Uh, sorry, this is a bit pixelated. The, the zoom change affected that. Um, so you, you'll, you'll want uh, web UIs to be able to go in and view your entity types and do add, edit, and delete operations. And so here we're using uh, functions in the Wolf la Wolfram language like form function, but the nice thing is we're not having to uh, you know, construct those manually. They can be generated from your entity types automatically. Likewise, with web APIs in enterprise software, it's pretty common to need to do things like serialization and deserialization. We've already talked about validation and then you know, passing these things around to various web APIs. So we have some built-in APIs. Uh, so the core data operations that I was showing you, such as entity create, we have web APIs for all those things. So let's call an EPC via this web API to create somebody named Paul and we get a res response back in JSON. And then we'll do a, a query using the entity get endpoint uh, to find that entity. So obviously we can do modifies and deletes as well. Um, but in addition, we want it to be very easy to create your own API. So here's a, a silly little API called acquire cats. <clears throat> and what I want to point out here is that unlike most API functions where you'd just be passing around scalars like integers and strings, this allows you to actually pass um, entities like person and uh, a list of cats here. And you're not needing to do any of the, the validation there um, or serialization or deserialization. We take care of that for you. And additionally, for things like deployment, uh, you can now just call your deployment function. And because you've associated that API with an endpoint name, we can deploy that to your EPC at the appropriate endpoint for you. And then just to demonstrate this validation, I'm going to call a local mocked copy of this. And again, this last name property has been uh, misspelled, and so uh, it's going to take care of detecting that and, and telling the caller that there's a problem. Logging is another interesting area for us. Um, a lot of projects will just write flat text files for logging, but then you need to do a lot of grepping and, and, and looking around. But what we do is we leverage uh, the Wolfram language's ability to easily you know, take structured information and pull it, uh, put it onto disk and pull it back out again so that what we're logging are, is, is actually structured. And we inject logging into all the web assets like API functions and, uh, and form pages and so on. So here's an example of a call to a form page that didn't go so well. Unfortunately, grammar apply returned a message, but that is detected and logged. And then we have a, a, a nice way to view that later. Uh, and even to see the stack trace and so on. Perhaps best of all, we actually take that structured information and put it into the database so that you can later uh, do structured queries just like you would for your entity types to pull out logging information. And so here's an example where we're putting that into a data set for easy viewing. So let's look at synchronization. Uh, we've got a couple ways that we ha we work with external uh, databases. We we uh, enterprise software is often in a world where you have a variety of different systems that all want to integrate with one another. Here's an example where we want to, on a daily basis, ingest a bunch of employee entities from an external system. So the way that this works uh, in this case is that we write the code to pull that data in. And then we um, turn it into these nested associations for these entities. And I just want to point out that there's a special property here called external ID, which is the ID of this entity in the external system. And also notice that there's, again, nesting going on. So we have phone number entities that are nested within the employee. Uh, there are organization levels and so on. Now, all these things exist as separate database tables, but you're not needing to worry about that. You just create this structure yourself. And once we have that, <clears throat> we just call entity sync, and it will take care of pu pulling that into the database. Now, when I pull the employees back out, notice that they now have local IDs uh, in our database, but we didn't have to write any uh, SQL code to do this synchronization ourselves. Now, another way of working with external systems is where you want the data to stay on the external system, but you'd like to be able to write queries that bridge multiple databases. So in this case, we define a contact entity type with a first name, last name, email addresses. We then define a second kind of concrete data type that inherits those properties from contact and then adds in that special external ID property again. Um, but from there, we also need to define an import mapping 
So we indicate what database this external entity will be on, uh, the table on that database, and then we define a property mapping that maps from our properties to the fields in that database table. So for external ID and phone number, the mapping is very simple, but for uh, email addresses, it gets more complicated because there's actually a join involved. So we define a column path that gives the uh, kind of the path through the various tables and fields to end up at the email addresses table and the email address field within that table. But once we've done that, um, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive because we can construct a query where we can say, give me the licenses where the registered user has a contact where one of the email addresses is this one here. And for it to execute this, what it first needs to do is break the query into two pieces. This piece, it will execute uh, in the external database to get the, ex the external IDs. And then it will compose a second query to run in our local database uh, to do the full query. And then we get the results back here. Um, and, and again, what's, what's nice about this is that it's a uniform layer of abstraction for you. You're not needing to worry about which part of the query is external and which part is local. All right, so let's take a look at natural language. So I'm gonna break this down into two parts. This part is called direct qualification. So when you, um, there, there's a technology in the Wolfram language called PLI, the function is called grammar apply. And that allows you to create grammars to do natural language. But rather than having you write those grammars automatically, we generate those grammars. So we have an entity type called order. And uh, so we can call our, our natural language function and it can create a symbolic representation for that without any kind of custom work on your, your side. Here's an example where we're qualifying orders by Amazon. And what it figures out is that we can qualify the source property of order by Amazon. And it creates, again, this symbolic representation. In this case, we want business to business orders, um, but we wanted to tailor the linguistics. So I'm just gonna go into this uh, entity type here and show you that there's an entity, an entity that has been given some custom linguistics to allow it to be referred to as just B2B. Once we've done that, we can do B2B orders and it, it, it knows how to interpret that. And here's an example where we're qualifying orders by two things, Amazon and B2C, and now it's qualifying two properties. All right, where it gets more interesting is indirect qualification. So with the query mathematical orders, what's complicated about that is that orders uh, contain something called configured product as a nested entity, and that contains a version product, the version product contains a product, and then finally that thing has a name Mathematica. So you need to go through multiple hops of nesting to be able to qualify orders by Mathematica. So what we do is we construct uh, in math, you'd call it a graph, where the nodes of that graph are the entity types and the edges between those nodes are the properties. And it can search that graph to find the proper multi-step qualification to, to symbolize mathematical orders. And even better, you can take the output of that NLU function and pass that to entity get, and it knows how to execute that query on the database to pull back the results. All right, so where we went from there is we realized that, um, you know, a lot of what you're wanting to do in the enterprise are actions or workflows, but actions are actually similar to entity types, or, or they are, you can think of them that way. So here we have uh, one called system transfer which if somebody installed Mathematic on one computer but wants to switch it over to another one, they may need to get in contact with their customer service. But for us to do that for them, we need to find their activation key and make a change to that. So we model this entity as a system transfer entity type with a property activation key. Um, and then we write an action function, which is the thing that we will give this system transfer entity to once we have its activation key filled in and, and our business logic will live in here. But before we can actually execute this, we need to figure out for a given customer, what activation key entity do we need to fill in here? And that's where the natural language and indirect qualification comes in handy. So um, system transfer for danielbeatwolfram.com. I'm gonna execute that here. And what it will do is it will again search that graph to come up with a symbolic representation for that query. In this case, there's actually a nested ambiguity list because there are two paths within the database which are valid for, for um, qualifying an activation key by an email address. 
So it's done that. Notice again that this actually involves um, uh, an external database, but that's uh, kind of hidden by this abstraction. So let's uh, see what that would look like using a web UI to do this workflow. We would type in system transfer and then click Submit. It's going to uh, create the symbolic representation, go out to the database and see which activation keys can be con uh, concretely filled in here. And it's going to find that, that Daniel has two products. And so the web UI is going to uh, display a screen to say, choose which activation key we want to uh, perform the system transfer on. So the user would click here, and now we have all the information that we need to create a final system transfer entity to call that uh, action function that we talked about, and it can produce the final result saying system transfer complete for this activation key. So what we're realizing is that that really is a common thing in organizations. You know, you've got these workflows that you want to do. You can typically uh, kind of initiate those using uh, a fairly simple uh, phrase that you can type in. It uh, often involves some indirect qualification, but once you have the appropriate symbolic representation, uh, you can execute on that, and it's a, an efficient way to go through a workflow. Okay, so the final thing that I want to look at are inference rules and how you can use those to create clean UIs. So here's a, a simple inference rule. It has two parts. This is a pattern, and this is the conclusion. So if the pattern is matched, we want to apply the conclusion. So what we're saying is that if Mathematica is being purchased and the use type is government or commercial, then the number of front-end and parallel kernels that that user is entitled to uh, is, is described here. Here's a more complicated example where we're saying if they're purchasing a Mathematica network, then the number of processes they get is actually a function of the number of seats that they're purchasing for their network. And the fact that the Wolfram language supports things like pure functions makes it very natural to be able to express this. And we don't need to write, you know, like a custom parser to, to load in these rules. It just, uh, it just works as is when we read these in. Uh, so those those are examples. Now let's actually run one of these. We have a what we call a configured product here of a Mathematica network with two seats. And when we apply the inference rules to that, you can see that it fills in uh, these various uh, properties with values according to those inference rules. Now once we have that, it makes it quite straightforward to build UIs. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create an empty association for a configured product that I would like to get populated. And I'm going to populate that using a UI. So I, I have this dynamic entity form function. I say that we're going to be working with the entity type configured product. I give it my empty association. And then I give it a list of properties that I would like to, to be UI fields. And notice that in most cases, I don't need to give a lot of detail or any detail at all about what this property means, what its valid values are, what its type is, those kinds of things because those are represented within the entity type itself. So I just uh, run this, and I'm going to type in Mathematica. And you can see um, I have a, a show entity true here. So it's showing me the association that's getting kind of populated as I go through the UI. Now, when I select network, um, it can now run those inference rules that I was talking about before. But the UI didn't need to uh, encode these directly. Those live right within the entity type. When I give the number of seats, it can now uh, do more of that inference rule because it has enough to now compute the final number of compute and control processes. And then just to round things off, I'll finish configuring my product. And now I have the final symbolic representation of my, my nested association here. Um, and as one final last step here, um, I'm going to take this uh, and uh, this association that I've created, I'm going to pass it to a function called calculate price and then grab the price and, and I get my results. So that's just an example of how to create a simple UI based on an entity type to, to populate an association and then you can run business logic on that. So uh, just to round things out here, I think our conclusion is, you know, we, we started off with this curiosity of would the Wolfram language in fact be uh, fertile soil for creating a symbolic ERP system. And I think um, everybody on the team thinks that the answer is, is yes, that it, there's um, uh, the, the, the language really is well suited for doing this kind of thing, not just for scientific computation, but also for representing 
business objects and, and creating rich layers of abstraction and natural language and that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll close there. All right. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, so as you see, uh, oh, I got beeped. Told me I got five minutes left. So um, the uh, we could go into detail about a lot of this. This was a very the technical side. You know, we're we're about eighteen months into this. We're building the framework, um, the building blocks for this, and and really the framework that Daniel's been building here with the team is going to have more uses than just an ERP system. 